Elizabeth Hardwick, or as we know her better, Bess of Hardwick, was born in 1527 to John Hardwick and Elizabeth Leake. Along with her three sisters and a brother, she grew up in the small manor house that her family had owned for six generations on the Hardwick estate. Bess blossomed into a young woman with a clear vision of what she wanted from life. Her family might have been considered minor gentry, but she possessed aspirations that contemporary women might admire. She would rise to be the second most powerful woman in the country, only pipped by Queen Elizabeth I. Bess was known to be exceptionally quick-witted, well-read, articulate and savvy. She would be a match for any Tudor suitor. Bess married her first husband, Robert Barlow, in 1543, when she was just 16. Sadly, he died the year after. In 1546, whilst in the employ of the Marchioness of Dorset, Frances Grey, mother of Lady Jane Grey, she met and married her second husband, Sir William Cavendish, who was 20 years her senior and twice a widower. The Hardwicks were a relatively prosperous family, but her wealth and standing was to stratospherically rise after marrying William. Soon after the wedding, he purchased the Chatsworth estate and best took on the role of project manager for the building and furnishing of Chatsworth House. After a happy life together and fathering eight children, William was to die in 1557. His death was to leave Bess with huge outgoings. William St. Lowe, politician and captain of the guard to Elizabeth I, became Bess's third husband in 1559. His duties ensured he was well known at court, and it wasn't long before Bess was appointed as a lady of the bedchamber to the Queen. This posting didn't last long, as she was embroiled in the sex scandal of Lady Jane Grey. It wasn't all bad, though. When William died in 1565, Bess inherited a sizeable estate. Bess married her fourth and final husband, George Talbot, the sixth Earl of Shrewsbury, in 1567. To ensure the forging of the two families' wealth and estates, George's son Gilbert married Bess's daughter Mary, and Bess's son Henry married George's daughter Grace. When Mary Queen of Scots sought refuge in England in May 1568, Elizabeth charged Talbot with her custody, where she remained until 1584. Rumours were rife that George had feelings for Mary, and Bess wasn't at all happy with the domestic threesome. By 1574, she'd had enough and separated from the Earl, leaving Chatsworth forever. Talbot had claimed the estate as his own, under the terms of their marriage agreement. George Talbot died in 1590, and just a year later Bess moved into Hardwick Old Hall. Renewed financially after Talbot's death, she set about the construction of Hardwick Hall, sited close to the Old Hall. With her initials strategically positioned on each side of the new house, alongside her coronet, visitors would be sure to appreciate that Bess had truly arrived. Power and wealth were hers alone. During my visit to the Hardwick estate, I was fortunate to stay in Rothorn Lodge. It's just a gentle stroll through the park to the hall. Arriving in the late afternoon, I only had time to briefly look around the house before closing time approached. In places, visitors still loitered before being ushered out by staff. Waking up the next day, the weather had turned. It was cold and foggy as I walked down to the hall. On entering, aside from the odd visitor and member of staff, it was exceptionally quiet. On this visit, I was able to appreciate the atmosphere, letting history soak into every pore. More importantly, I had time to talk with our friends and share the house together in peace. Entering the hall, it feels remarkably grand in its stature, but you might be surprised to learn that in Elizabethan times it was used for the servant's entry point, as well as the entrance hall. It's no surprise to me that there might be residents in the house who are aware of who I am and why I came. It's such a happy place. It's such a nice atmosphere here. And yesterday I couldn't sense it because there were too many people. 
I've grown used to work getting out of my impending visit. There's no way of arriving unannounced anymore. It's moments like these that I feel close to those who walk beside me. The atmosphere as I climb the stairs is palpable and a gentleman announces his presence. It's an oddly comforting feeling knowing I'm not alone as I make my way up. These stairs form the main ceremonial route to the staterooms on the top floor. The scale and length of the flight is magnificent. Halfway up the stairs is an area known as the Great Half Space and was used by servants to sleep whilst on standby. The landing is quite dark and feels heavy so I wasn't surprised to record a voice here. The specificity of the comment I capture relating to the architecture in this location is remarkable. I've grown to love period lighting and the way it can transform the atmosphere in a room. As I reach the top of the stairs and look up at the lantern, two voices are captured, one of whom references the light. There would likely have been a sentry on this door, as it leads to the Grand Chamber and access to nobility. The Great Chamber is a lavish representation of the magnitude of Bess's ambitions. Hardwick was designed as a palace, with a presence chamber for state business, a privy chamber for eating and meeting with selected guests, a withdrawing chamber, a bedchamber and a long gallery. Although Bess might have sat in state under a canopy, it wasn't this one. This structure dates to the 17th century and was erected in this room during the 19th century by the Bachelor Duke. There would have been protection for the family milling with guests in this room. Although the need for my security is little, I appreciate the sentiment of the gentleman. The High Frieze depicts country scenes in the court of Diana, the Virgin Goddess and Huntress. This was probably a purposeful reference to Elizabeth, the Virgin Queen, another fiercely strong woman. The appearance of the Long Gallery is a romantic creation by the 5th and 6th Dukes in the 19th century. Bess's will detailed 37 portraits hanging in the gallery, which would have appeared more sparsely decorated than it is today. A large number of the original artworks would have been pictures of royal subjects, an important homage for the landed gentry to be seen to display. We may idly wander where we fancy, but I suspect many times we are influenced and directed by those unseen for their own reasons. Those around me know of my Tudor leanings, and I have no doubt that they have guided me to where I choose to visit, and what I see. Is that Thomas More? Another one of Thomas More, is it? I don't know. The magnificent canopy staged in the gallery was originally the tester and head of the state bedroom, erected here by the Sixth Duke for its dramatic impact on visitors. In Bess's time, the room would have been considerably taller, and it's been through many transformations since the house was completed. In the 1700s, it was a bedroom. 
the sixth duke converted it into a library, and in the 20th century, it was refunctioned as a state bedchamber. If you've watched more than one of my videos from Tudor and Elizabethan properties, it won't surprise you to hear the name Rawley. Whilst I was unable to find any record of him visiting Hardwick, Bess had spent time at Elizabeth's court and would likely have connected to the Queen's favourite Sir Walter whilst in London. At the age of 12, Bess was sent away to become a lady-in-waiting for her distant relative Anne Gainsford, Lady Zouche, who in turn was lady-in-waiting to Anne Boleyn. And so began Bess's climb to join the ranks of the nobility. The voices recorded in this chamber possibly reflect overheard gossip by members of the household. Bess was known to love a bit of gossip. Which Berlin, I wonder, was the subject of conversation? The context of the translated EVP can only be assumed and can never be taken as proof of the speaker's historical identity. Bess would have spent many months over her eight pregnancies with laying in periods prior to giving birth, not at Hardwick. Whom, I wonder, is the gossip in reference to? Queen Elizabeth I or the impending birth of Arbella at nearby Chatsworth? Are we hearing an example of an Elizabethan one-upmanship? Someone is keen to express their superiority to the Berlins. If you say the name Mary in the context of Hardwick, you might easily be forgiven for thinking of the Mary Queen of Scots bedchamber. However, the house was not completed until after she had been executed. Mary had been held at several of George Talbot's properties, but never on the Hardwick estate. I personally think it more likely that the lady mentioned in the following clip would be Bessie's daughter, Mary Talbot. On entering the room, I feel distinctly uneasy. What's clear from the voice I captured here is that the gentleman is aware he is encroaching on a private area. Maybe we were both walking in on a previous resident. Standing in the closet, there's a weighty atmosphere, but I feel like lingering, and I wasn't sure why. A man's comment was captured, and for this location, his sentiment was perfectly correct. Bess had a turbulent relationship with her son, Henry disinheriting him in 1603 and leaving the Hardwick estate to William, her second son. Is it Henry Cavendish who awaits my company as I enter the stairwell? <laughs> Harry is a common alternative to Henry for the period and often interchangeable, especially when spoken of by friends. The chapel was originally on two levels, the family using the upper sections, but this was closed by the fifth duke to make a steward's room for the servants. The present contents of the room, although they appear to fit, are not what Bess would have known. The pulpit dates possibly to the 17th century, and the communion rails were fabricated in the 19th century. It nevertheless feels very intimate. Bess was a devout Protestant, 
and her choice of grandparents for her eight children included Queen Elizabeth I, Lady Jane Grey and John Dudley, their rank of nobility reflecting her beliefs and aspirations for her children's future. Being alone in the half-light, it was easy to let go of the present and imagine how more recent members of the household would have gathered kneeling in prayer. Capturing music is a rare occurrence for me, singing even more so, and for it to be so loud and clear is extraordinary. Although the first few words are obvious, the rest of the phrase takes a little guessing, and I'm not confident of a translation. I'd be very interested to know what you hear him singing, or if you recognise the melody. I find it curious that the staircases in this building are such strong areas for vocal capture. Descending the stairs, I stop for a few moments by the chair. Looking down, the light flickers briefly, but then remains steady. Either I was being followed, or word was spreading to members of the household. Only one living person knew who I was on site, and they were in another building. I do love to cook. I'm not sure if that could be a reason for those in the kitchen areas to come forward so clearly. It never fails to brighten my day when I capture such positive voices. So much for visiting hard work on my own. The kitchen we see today was largely installed by the Sixth Duke. In the Elizabethan period, cooking was done on large open fires. Only the bread was baked in a brick oven. In comparison with the pantry, there seemed a rather uncomfortable atmosphere in the kitchen. That may have been due to the dwindling natural light and being alone in an unfamiliar building, or it may have been my ability to sense the unsavoury company I was keeping in this room. Stepping into the larder and corridor, I immediately get the sense of people rushing around and of being in the way. I loved this room. It was bright, warm and welcoming. For 30 minutes or so I lingered, imagining the smell of bread ovens baking fresh loaves for the morning service and pastries ready for afternoon tea. It's not the first time I've recorded a speaker who is aware of my medical history. Certainly nobody at Hardwick would have known about a tiny bit of remaining brain tumour. I wonder who he might be and if there's anything of our lives that remains beyond their knowledge. Somehow I doubt it. On the floor plans of the house, this room had no title, but walking into it, 
I had an immediate feeling that there would once have been a desk and storage. The voices recording here are quite tense. They sound as if a member of staff is being chastised, or officially reprimanded. The muniment chamber was integral to the smooth running and accountability of Bess's estate. Records offices such as this became increasingly common in large houses, with doors being overplated in iron to protect the contents from fire. In keeping with the function of this room, the gentleman who speaks refers to a written communication. As a former auditor, I felt very at home in this room and would have loved to delve into the drawers to see what secrets it held. At the break of World War II, sections of the park were designated for use to the Army and Air Force. The topography of the land isn't ideal for flying, but a small area on top of the limestone ridge was just large enough for a landing strip. It was here the 1st Parachute Brigade was formed in 1941, and going forward it became the depot and school of airborne forces, where volunteers went through selection tests for specialised training. Every airborne participant in the Normandy invasion went through their initial training at Hardwick. My knowledge of the intricacies of World War II is still wanting, but with each location I visit, my interest deepens. I should have guessed that my dear friend from the circle would be with me as I learned of those who were billeted at the house. He's spoken so many times, I think you might recognise his voice too. It's hard to believe, if you weren't present when I recorded, that nobody was physically in the area, and there was no soundtrack playing in the room. These are the voices of those who lived in another era, and have returned to share their message with you. They fought so that we could be free. I'm glad that when we pass over, painful memories dim. It's hard enough carrying them when we're alive. Being able to hear the voices of those who gave their life for us is a great privilege. We must never forget their sacrifice. Bess died on the 13th of February 1608 at the age of 81. Her body was placed in a vault in All Saints Church, Derby. Thank you for accompanying me on my trip to Hardwick Hall. Please do return again to join me on my next adventure. Bye for now.